10 questions, true or false, it must be the Funky Friday Anatomy Quiz. If you're ready, let's go. We're going to have a series of questions and there will be uh, two upper limb, two lower limb, two head and neck, and four thorax, abdomen, and pelvis. And you'll see me here in the corner, but I may shift around so that you could see the uh, diagrams a bit more clearly. So let's go. The first question on the upper limb is, the coracobrachialis muscle flexes the arm. Is that true or is that false? The coracobrachialis muscle flexes the arm. The answer is true. Now the coracobrachialis, as the name suggests, takes its origin from the coracoid process of the scapula. And you can see it here in this diagram attaching uh, distally on the medial shaft or the anterior medial shaft of the upper part of the humerus bone. And you can imagine that if that muscle were to shorten, it would have the effect of bringing the humerus forward, which is flexion of the arms. Now the um, coracobrachialis arises in common with another muscle, and you can see it here. This is the biceps brachii muscle, and it's the short head of the biceps brachii that you can see attaching from the coracoid process. And together, these are known as the conjoint tendon. And um, they're both supplied by the same muscle of the same nerve, which is the musculocutaneous nerve. Now, there is one more muscle in the anterior compartment of the arm, and that is, in fact, the brachialis muscle. So that gives you that lovely mnemonic, BBC, biceps, brachialis, and coracobrachialis. Um, so the next question. The radial nerve passes through the supinator muscle to become the posterior interosseous nerve. The radial nerve passes through the supinator muscle to become the posterior interosseous nerve. You can stop the video at any point and pause it if you'd like to take a few more moments to think about the answer. The answer to this is in fact true. The radial nerve does pass through the supinator muscle to become the posterior interosseous nerve. Now the radial nerve is one of the terminal divisions of the posterior cord of the brachial plexus and there are five terminal divisions of the um, posterior brachial plexus, posterior cord of the brachial plexus. And you can see the radial nerve here running down behind the back of the humeral shaft where it's very close to the humeral shaft bone and it emerges on the lateral aspect of the humeral uh, shaft distally. Um, the radial nerve supplies the mobile wad of three or two of the mobile wad of three. It supplies the brachioradialis and the extensor carpi radialis longus. And what happens next is that it splits into its superficial and deep branches in the lateral wall of the cubital fossa. And the cubital fossa being um, a sort of imaginary triangle within the uh, anterior aspect of the shoulder, uh, elbow joint region. I'm a shoulder surgeon. Um, and the deep part of the radial nerve then goes on to supply extensor carpi radialis brevis. And once it's done this, the deep radial nerve passes through the two heads of the supinator muscle to become the posterior interosseous nerve. And here you can see it. Um, it's not uh, particularly accurate here, but it, it, you can see the supinator muscle. You can see how that radial nerve is closely related to the muscle. And if I shift myself here, you can see how it then emerges becoming the posterior interosseous nerve. The lower limb questions. The pectineus muscle is found in the medial compartment of the thigh and is innervated by the obturator nerve. Is that true or is it false? The pectineus or pectineus muscle is found in the medial compartment of the thigh and is innervated by the obturator nerve. The answer to this is actually false. The pectineus muscle is found in the medial compartment of the thigh, but it's not innervated by the obturator nerve. It is, in fact, um, it's, uh, innervated by another nerve, but just to show you that there are six muscles in the medial compartments of the thigh. Now, these are the obturator externus, which is not shown in this diagram, uh, the pectineus, which you can see here, which forms uh, part of the floor of the femoral triangle. There's gracilis, which is the most medial one that you can see in the diagram. Next to it is a ductal longus. A ductor brevis you can't see in this diagram, and a ductor magnus is a big adductor muscle found behind these. Um, I've also demonstrated here sartorius and rectus femoris, which are more on the lateral aspect of the thigh there. 
Um, all of the nerves in the medial compartment are supplied by the obturator nerve, except for pectineus, which is supplied by the femoral nerve. And you can see that it's in the femoral triangle, so it kind of makes sense that it is supplied by the femoral nerve. There is also one cheeky little muscle here, which is the adductor magnus, which is such a big muscle, and it has two functionally different components. It has an adductor component, which is supplied by the obturator nerve, but it also has a hamstring component, which is supplied by the tibial portion of the sciatic nerve. The popliteus muscle arises from the lateral femoral condyle. Is that true or false? The popliteus muscle arises from the lateral femoral condyle. The answer to that is in fact true. The popliteus muscle is one of the deep muscles of the posterior compartment of the leg. And it does arise from the lateral femoral condyle. And if I move me over here, you can see it inserts onto the posterior aspect of the superior shaft of the tibia bone in the leg. Um, the popliteus muscle plays a role in initiating gait. So if you're standing, what it does, it unlocks the extended knee. And you can imagine if these, this muscle were to contract and shorten, it would have the effect of externally rotating or laterally rotating the femur on the tibia. And that helps to um, initiate gait. The head and neck. So these questions are now the head and neck questions. Um, and let's go. The glossopharyngeal nerve provides a sensory taste to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. The glossopharyngeal nerve provides sensory taste to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. Is that true or is that false? The answer is false. The glossopharyngeal nerve is the ninth cranial nerve and it does provide sensory taste to the tongue but not to the anterior two-thirds. It's the posterior third of the tongue. The anterior two-thirds of the tongue is the facial nerve. In the neck, the cricoid cartilage is situated inferior to the thyroid cartilage. Is that true or is it false? In the neck, the cricoid cartilage is situated inferior to the thyroid cartilage. This is in fact true. The cricoid cartilage is situated inferior to the thyroid cartilage. And you can see it here highlighted in thick and it looks quite small. The thyroid is quite large at the front, but the cricoid is quite narrow or, or short in height. But look what happens when you turn it around and look at it posteriorly. It becomes much bigger, which is why it has the characteristic signet ring shape that you can see here. Moving on to the thorax, abdomen and pelvis. The fibrous pericardium consists of two layers, an outer parietal layer and an inner visceral layer. Is that true or false? The answer is false. It doesn't. It's in fact the serous layer, which, uh, sorry, I'll just go back there. The serous layer, so the heart is covered by the pericardium. It has an outer fibrous layer, which is very thick, and the inner layer is the serous layer, and it's the inner layer, the serous pericardium, which has the two layers, the um, parietal layer and the visceral layer. And the visceral layer is very closely adherent to the heart, and in fact, these two layers are continuous at the root of the great vessels. The hepatic portal vein drains blood directly into the inferior vena cava. Is that true or false? The answer is false. And here you can see um, a very complex network, uh, intricate network of veins that take blood from the gut and up towards the liver. So what happens is the... Um, Splenic vein, sorry, I'll move me again. The splenic vein joins with the inferior mesenteric vein, the inferior mesenteric vein draining the distal part of the colon, uh, and the, uh, it joins with the superior mesenteric vein, which drains the uh, small intestines and the cecum and upper ascending colon and 
almost two thirds of the transverse colon, they join together to form the hepatic portal vein, but they then go to the liver so that all the nutrients that have been absorbed from the gut can be processed by the liver. And the veins then go from the liver to the inferior vena cava, and these are the hepatic veins, not the portal veins. Next question. The abdominal aorta terminates at vertebral level L4 into the right and left common iliac arteries. Is that true or false? The answer is actually true. Uh, and you can see here, this is the abdominal aorta running down the midline and it divides into the right and left common iliac arteries. And these then go on to divide into the external uh, iliac arteries, which goes on down to um, become the femoral artery and supply structures in the lower limb, whereas the internal uh, iliac artery goes on to supply structures within the pelvis. And the final question. The anal sinuses form a ring around the anal canal known as the dentate line. Is that true or false? This is in fact true. So the anal valves do form a ring around the anal canal, known as the dentate line, and it's also known as the pectinate line. The dentate line is formed by anal columns, which are, are a series of um, anal sinuses, and it happens a, around the midpoint of the anal canal. But there are very clear, so it's, it's described as a watershed mark, and there are some very clear differences between the um, structures above the dentate line and below the dentate line. And um, in this table, you can see here that above the dentate line, the embryonic origin is actually from the endoderm, so it's more like gut tissue, whereas below the dentate line, it's ectoderm. The epithelium is different. Above the dentate line, it's columnar epithelium, whereas below the dentate line is stratified squamous uh, epithelium, which eventually goes on to become keratinized like skin. The blood supply is different. Above the dentate line is the superior rectal artery, which is a branch of the uh, inferior mesenteric artery, whereas below the dentate line is the middle and inferior rectal arteries. The venous drainage is different. Uh, above the dentate line is the inferior mesenteric vein, and below the dentate line is from the internal iliac vein. It's sorry, to the internal iliac vein. The nerve supply is also different, the inferior hypogastric plexus and pelvic splanchnic nerves, whereas uh, below the dentate line is the inferior rectal nerves, uh, which are a branch of the pudendal nerves. So that's our Funky Friday quiz for this week. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, let me know, leave me some comments below. I do read every comment and I do try and reply to every comment and uh, suggestions are very welcome. If you have topics you'd like me to cover either in a quiz or as part of uh, one of my anatomy clinics, we can certainly do that. So please let me know how you're enjoying it. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram, at Funky Anatomy is our handle. Uh, coming up this week, Prof Vichy is going to be doing a lecture, a live lecture on the uh, abdominal cavity. He's going to finish off from his previous lecture and he's also going to talk about the surface um, markings of the abdomen. Uh, we also have another quiz coming out next week, hopefully, uh, if I'm not in clinic. And uh, we are going to be releasing our very first head and neck video. If you haven't already, please go and visit our website. There is so much content on there, so many um, instructional videos. There's also revision videos, revision slides, there's worksheets, there's quizzes, basically everything we can to support you, particularly during this time during COVID when a lot of it is distance learning. So we've got it all there. And honestly, it will save you hours and hours of plowing through books. Um, we're here to support you. Uh, let us know how and Thank you very much for um, all the support you've given us. Until next time.